Please take your seats. The session will begin momentarily. my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening session on the talk by Chunky Jung, professor from Stony Brook University, uh, for this talk about physics of sport. Chunky, strange to introduce him. Normally, he introduced some younger people in our department. But Professor Chunky Jung is a distinguished professor in, in at Stony Brook University and recipient of many um, honors and prizes. He is a recipient of the Breakthrough Prize for the neutrino uh, experiments that he was part in Warnell. He has received various local awards, the Chancellor's Awards for Research um, and Teaching. His early career, he grew up in uh, South Korea and did his PhD at Indiana University, from which afterwards he has uh, been at Stanford for a while, and then at Stony Brook University, where he has grown into his current position. He is well, well known for this particular talk, and you will see why through his presentation. But it is part of the effort that he created two courses at Stony Brook early in 2002, uh, 2003. And this one is one of the most popular ones, even at Stony Brook, and, uh, and has been picked up with uh, various flares by, by networks uh, outside and in, in, in national and networks. So without further ado, I want to introduce, bring you Professor Chen Ki Jung, who will tell us about capturing innovations and underlying physics in sports. Chen Ki. Thanks, Abe. Uh, can you hear me? Is the microphone working? OK, all right. Well, I'd like to thank first uh, APS and uh, and all of you uh, coming here. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit uh, than the usual things you talk about at APS April meeting, and uh, we'll, we'll enjoy. How, how many of you like sports? Anybody like sports? I think it's Minnesota. It's ice, ice hockey territory. Uh, I don't have a lot to talk about ice hockey, but uh, you will, I think, enjoy. All right, so title of my talk is Capturing Innovations and Underlying uh, Physics in Sports. So let's look at this video first. This is one of my favorite video. This is a knuckleball thrown by a pitcher. His name is R.A. Dickey. Uh, he was uh, one of my favorite in the Mets. And uh, you can see he's throwing the ball. Baseball is going to the right and then to the left. It should not be doing that, right? Do you, do you agree? It's like a weird thing. And uh, how does he do this? And in fact, I will talk about a little bit more later. He does not know actually he's doing that. He just throws the ball, then ball does it. Okay. So, okay. So then, all right, he tried to explain this thing to Show me the grip. Well, you know, there's a lot of different grips. The grip, the grip that I use is if that's the horseshoe of the baseball, I take my fingernails on my pointer finger and my middle finger, and I dig them in right behind the horseshoe. And then I take my thumb and I put it above the seam on the left side of the baseball and uh, take this finger, set it right there on the, that side, and my pinky's kind of off. So that's, that's what it looks like. And I, 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 th I think about trying to get my knuckles to the top, to the top of the baseball. Because if the enemy of the knuckleball is spin, then anything that you do that would impart spin, you got to kind of um, 
remove. So I just use these points as stability points and then I just try to release it at the opportune moment. What, what makes the knuckleball dance so much? I think a, probably a physicist would be able to tell you more than me, but you know the way that it looks like in the air is that when you throw a ball with no spin or like an eighth of a rotation forward, you, it looks like the seams are fighting to get to the other side of the baseball, so it creates a lot of movement. The, the a lot of is coming talking. this way, <laughs> the seams trying to fight against that, sends the ball in multiple directions from the time it leaves your hand to the time it gets to the plate. But again, I think a physicist would be able to tell you exactly why it does that. I mean, it's kind of... Thank you, Ari Dickey. Yes, uh, physics should, should, should explain that, and uh, what he said is all wrong. Okay, so uh, anyway, but uh, when Ari Dickey was uh, traded to uh, Blue Jays, I, I cried because he was a beautiful pitch to, uh, to see and then able to explain it in physics and all of that. But anyway, this particular presentation is a uh, uh, collaboration started about almost 10 years ago. Uh, New York Times uh, sports media editor, uh, Bedel Sajé, uh, he is a Stony Brook alumni, so he, alumna, so he and I uh, put together by the commission by Stony Brook Foundation uh, Alumni Association, and we, we, uh, I put together this presentation. So also this uh, is based on the physics sports course I developed, uh, first offer in 2003, and trying to teach physics to students using sports, also at the same time, using physics to understand sports better. So that, is, that was the idea behind. Uh, and then, and when we had that, I had that, uh, I got called on anytime there's a, a controversies in the sports or something happens, then, then I get uh, interviewed and all of that by various different media. It's written all here. I, I like the fact that I was interviewed by Al Jazeera. Okay. So these are the, all the sports which covered by soccer and the baseball, uh, football, and, and, even, and tennis and many other. Okay, so let's start with the, what is the hang time of Michael Jordan? Do you, do you know who Michael Jordan is? Yes. Okay, I think everybody knows who Michael Jordan is. And if you see Michael Jordan, when he dunks, he just jumps up in the air, it looks like hung in the air like Superman flying, and then dunks, right? So hang time is defined as the feet of the uh, player leaves the floor, and then dunks and comes down. So it goes up and down, right? So it's projectile motion. So Michael Jordan's hang time, how much is it? Let's see, how, how much is it? Do you know Michael Jordan? Yeah? No? Maybe dad can answer. Less than one second, hmm. Anybody else? Forever. Forever, okay. A few more, what? Two seconds. Two, three seconds? Three, three, four? Three, two, three, okay, three sounds like a, okay, that's consensus. All right, actually, just two days ago, I had a dinner with uh, Barry Barish, who's a 2017 uh, Nobel Prize winner. And so I say, Barry, how much is the uh, Michael uh, Jordan's hang time? He said, three seconds. So whoever says three seconds, you can get Nobel Prize as well. <laughs> now the problem is, although Barry is an extraordinary guy, smart guy, he's wrong. Michael Jordan's hang time is actually just one second. It's one second. It is an illusion because we see so much of the slow motion dunks and things like that. So, and at the same time, the way we see things, our perception is much longer than what actual time is, what physical time is. So, now if you look at this video with the view, this, this is all slow motion videos, right? But look at real time video, if you think, say, 1,000, that's what it will be in there. You'll get more than 41. Here, look Mission at it. Control, ready for launch. One thousand. See, that's just one second. And Dominique to his feet. So let's let's see how hang time is related to the vertical jump. Actually, uh, it's very interesting. You can use physics one on one. Very simple calculation. You can relate a vertical jump and a hang time. So the uh, Michael Jordan has a forty-eight inch 
vertical jump, that's 122 uh, centimeters. And uh, we can calculate his hang time. What about uh, Nate Robinson, which has a 43.5 inches of vertical jump? And uh, um, the, uh, is there any relationship between vertical jump and then hang time? So first of all, let me uh, uh, note that there's two different uh, vertical jump. One is a standing vertical, so you're not moving at all, you stand and jump up, which is harder. And the other is a max vertical. This is you allow approach or run before you jump, okay? It's usually that one gives you your highest uh, uh, jumping distance, height. So in Physics 101, almost all the physicists here, professors, uh, probably has taught Physics 101. There you use this formula, these four formulas, and then the, in particular, the one relating uh, the, dis, uh, the height, y, with the time, and with the g is 9.8. And then if you put, using this formula, the fact that when you jump, at the peak of the jump, you stand, right? You go up and you have to turn down, you stand. So you can simply calculate the dropping, if you know the h, if you know the time it drops, and you multiply two, then you get the actual hang time. So that calculation can be done very easily. The bottom line is the hang time is two times square root of two h over g, with h is the vertical jump, okay? So, and, and then with that, I, I tabulated the <clears throat> table for Michael Jordan. Spud Webb, Spud Webb was a, one of the smallest uh, NBA uh, basketball player, but he had a great leap, he can dunk, you know, he's only uh, his height, his height is only uh, uh, five, five seven, okay. But he can actually dunk. And then uh, Nate Robinson is five nine. Is also he can dunk. He had, these guys has like huge vertical jump. But in the end, you calculate hang time. Michael Jordan is only one second. Spot Webb is point nine eight and such. So mo mostly point nine and one one second. That's all. Now I'm going to introduce. Interesting here, uh, what I call the J factor, of course, my last name is Jung, so it's J factor. <laughs> J factor is height, uh, vertical jump, divided by player's height. Now, I will tell you why this is important. Michael Jordan is 0.62, Spud Webb is now higher than Michael Jordan, 0.69, and then Nate Robinson is 0.63, is a little bit bigger, a bit higher than uh, uh, Michael Jordan. So this, this factor becomes in, uh, important, uh, we are discussing sports later. On, uh, on the other the NBA average, um, vertical jump is only about 28 inches, point, uh, seven, 70 centimeters, and uh, a hang time is about 0.7 second. Okay. So we talked about all of this. Now this is one of my favorite things. That's just uh, You all Robinson. know Deron James, right? Deron James, Back of the, room, we'll the many multiple uh, MVP of Here's NBA. Drives past Bellinelli, blocked from behind by Robinson. Nate Robinson, who is 5'9", is blocking him. Okay, so watch him get it carefully. The slow motion will come up. Nate Robinson back, Bellinelli contests. Robinson gets Watch it this. Cleanly. It's a clean block. Rolls up. Yao Ming's turnaround jump shot in the garden. So I've seen Imagine you are Nate Robinson. You're going to talk about this since all your life. Your children, the grandchildren, neighbor, everybody has said, I block LeBron James. Okay? So this is, this is an amazing thing. Uh, um, but because of Nate Robinson, even though he's a 5'8, it's actually, I heard it's actually 5'8. Five, uh, five nine, but he's five eight. Uh, with the shoes, he's five nine, and then he would because he's a great leaper. He was able to time perfectly and block LeBron James. He also blocked Yao Ming, who is a seven foot six. Yao Ming was doing turnaround jump shot. It's Madison Square Garden. I was actually there watching that, and he turned around to shoot, and then Nate Robinson blocked it. Right. So imagine five nine blocking seven six. It's amazing. So. Michael Jordan is, is one of the greatest deeper in the NBA. Can he be a world champion in high jump? They are related, right? High jump. So, okay. High jump world record is men's uh, uh, record is uh, uh, done by Javier Sotomayor, 
from Cuba. He is uh, uh, 1.95 meter tall. And uh, his, his uh, record is outdoor 2.45 meters. Well, Michael Jordan was how much was that? 1.2 meters. So this is 2.45 meters. How do, you, how do you jump suddenly? Somebody jumps almost uh, one, more than one meter higher than Michael Jordan. And this is, is the longest uh, man's high jump record in history. And uh, uh, the, uh, which I already talked about the Michael Jordan. And the woman's uh, record is 2.09 uh, meters. So just ab above the two meters. And then this is also long as they held a high jump record. Okay, so how, do you think Michael Jordan can uh, be high jumper? The numbers are not comparable here, right? But there are some more things for us to understand uh, this. So the, the history of a high jump is interesting. This is uh, 1912. This is how, this is normally you will think you will do, right? You have a bar, you will jump over like that. And then, and then they say, well, going that way, you, you know, legs on the way. So they decided to go sideways. But then it didn't work out that well. So they decided to develop something called the scissor uh, method. And then the record is, is only 1.6 meters. It's not that great compared to height of 6.2 of that athlete. And then, OK, they decided to go sideways again. And then what I like called the frog method. You can see they figured that if you go sideways, that your tip of your toe is on, in the way. So they decided to go like that. So, you know, it's like a frog method. I don't think they call it that way. I call it frog method. But then came the revolution. 1968 Olympics, Dick Fosbury showed up, and he suddenly jump the bar over backward. Everybody else was doing front and side, and he showed up and then jumped over backward. And so you could watch this thing, and then especially his this arm position, when he first executed a very flop is this. And then his best, best is 2.24 meters. So you can see 1.6 to the like huge jump, right, when he did this. This is like revolution. It will be like discovery of Higgs or discovery of uh, uh, gravitational wave, discovery of neutrino mass. Yes, thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yes. So, amazing feat. So, what is the big deal about this fast uh, flop? This has to do with uh, understanding center of mass, right? So, for young people here, um, let's see. Where did I put that one? Okay, way up there. Let me go ahead. If you have a hula hoops, I usually use a hula hoops. I don't have, I didn't bring it, so I'm going to use my hanger. You have uh, this hanger. Where is the central mass of this hanger? Where is the central mass? Here? Where? It will be somewhere here, right? Because I hold it like that. The gravity like gives you one line. If I hold it here, it goes here. So central mass does not need to be in a, a physical material body. It can be empty space. Now, if I take this one away, imagine this is a upper body, and this is a lower body of Fosberry. Then central mass is actually here when you are bent, bent lo location. So what happens is that when Fosberry is executing a Fosberry flop, this case is a uh, uh, different person. Your head is here, body's arched like that. This makes sort of almost a circle, half, half circle, right? This is actually a really perfect position if you look at it. Central mass is here. So when this uh, athlete jumps over bar, central mass does not actually go over the bar. It's kind of cheating. It's kind of cheating, right? And, and then, so uh, that's why having this fast rate flop, because key thing is here, knee, because our knees bend backward, not forward. So bending, go, jumping backward is much more natural way to do rather than jumping forward. So you can make beautiful this uh, half arch, and then the central mass is here. So the central mass can actually go under the bar when you go over. So that is one of the really, really uh, key essence of fast flop. 
And then, of course, in terms of the, uh, height difference between Michael Jordan's vertical compared to the record of 2.45, is that when you jump, your center of mass is already what? One meter above ground, right? And so it also tells you, if you're a taller athlete, you have advantage. You start out with the center of mass higher. So high jump is inherently pre it is, it's a prejudice against young, small people, young <laughs> You should not try to be a high jumper, right? It's, it's, it's a, you are as a taller, obviously center of mass, starting center of mass much higher, it's easier to go over. So all of the uh, high jumpers are uh, men about 6'5", 6'6", even women is a 6'4", the record holders. And so you have to be very, very tall. This is uh, uh, Javier Sotomayor uh, doing a uh, record-breaking uh, jump. Now notice his arm position. If you remember what I said to notice fast rest arm position, compared to fast rest arm, arm position, uh, Javier's arm position. And that was 2 meters 45, a new world record for Sotomayor, the only man who has gone over 243 or higher. And there it is, being uh, congratulated by a great number of his teammates, the world indoor champion earlier on this year, Vale there, the uh, high hurdler, hugging him the hardest, I think. And Javier Sotomayor, who lives a very modest lifestyle, we understand, in Cuba, will go as a result of that jump and his He has a beautiful stride. I mean, beautiful Duke running. Duke very strong favorite. Yes, it's talking to him in the I find uh, um, uh, athletes, uh, there's a, a lot of beauty in, in just their, not only body, the way they run. It's like, you know, listening Mozart or some beautiful uh, classical music or, or painting. It's, the Olympic champion, so, world record, if you notice, his arm record, is stretched out, meter. different from Fasveri. That arm aids making the body even more bigger hemisphere, right? So that, that's what makes it, uh, technique-wise, he's doing better than what Fasveri originally uh, performed. I, well, I was trying to figure out. I couldn't find anywhere actually the physics was, uh, uh, he actually knew. One thing, one thing he, may, he may have found it accidentally because before Fasovery, they are not allowed to use a mat, you know, the, when you jump over. So if you go backward, you, it hurts you, right? And then, and then, <clears throat> 96 day around that time, they were allowed to have a mat. So I think it, maybe he tried, and then oh, she, this one was much, much better. So I, I don't, I have not figured it out. So, and uh, this is a woman. Um, she is or six four. It's very tall, a very tall woman. So that we, we, you start out with the center of mass very high. <clears throat> She wants to go at least a new person best two meters and I like this video because she has a uh, uh, style. Yes, she goes clear. What a wonderful jump from her. <laughs> Thank you, it. She's celebrating already. <laughs> Here comes the dance. I mean, anything you do, right, you should have fun, right? I, that's why I like this. And then it goes with the same thing with the physics. When you do physics, you should be, you should be having fun. Otherwise, you shouldn't be doing that. Antoinette Di Martino. So look at that. It's how beautiful it is, right? Look at the way she bends. So in her case, really, uh, uh, central mass is not really above the bar. It's way, way below. Hmm? She's uh, from Romania or Bulgaria or somewhere. Okay. So then... Uh, no, the, the Vlasic is not. Uh, Soto Mayor is still world record, yeah. So then uh, <clears throat> Derek Druin uh, from Canada, he's also like six foot five. You can see that, you know, commonality of all these people very tall. And then uh, he was reigning uh, champion in high jump. He, he got gold medal uh, in Rio Olympics. His personal best 2.4, it's a little shy of 2.45 by Javier Sotomayor. And the reason why I'm using it is that, of course, he's Indiana Hoosier. Uh, I, I graduated from Indiana, so. Like, it's important, right? Yes. All right. Okay, so 
This is a, a New York Times uh, put together uh, a little something about uh, their drawing. There's not a whole lot of things that have uh, adjusted or changed since then. That's actually not true. As I said, arm position made a huge difference it after uh, possibly did the first You need time. to find what works for you. You see jumpers try to run as fast as they can and then they put their foot down and their leg isn't able to handle it, so they end up just blowing through the bar. Before I even take off, I've already got that left arm up that is hopefully gonna guide me over the bar. Once I'm actually on my mark and I'm about to jump, everything sort of just gets blacked out except for myself and the mat. So in terms of technique-wise, uh, in my physicist's point of view, Derek Duroyan has the perfect, most perfect uh, uh, the, uh, te technique. Um, Fosberry, when he jumped, he had his arm here. So he did not use, utilize his arm to make more bigger arch. And when Sotomayor did that, he uh, spread the arm like more sideways, this way. It does not help too much in terms of Derek's drawing, you see, he goes like this, and then it makes it, uses really tip of his hand all the way to the tip of his toe, make a big, nice art, you know, have hemisphere. So that, that is what it really, he perfected, uh, yeah. Well, they don't. You don't want. To, the reason is that they, you don't want to go straight to the to the to the bar because your forward momentum is going to blow you up, right? So, making an arch to make so that they don't they reduce forward momentum. That's that's the reason why they do that. Oh, hang on, I forgot uh, comments. Okay, so taller as athletes as I explained, has in hard, long legs and a small butt. Small butt is important because when you go over, you don't want to hit the bar with the butt. Has an inherent advantage in high jump. And uh, that's because higher position in their initial center of mass. Perhaps we need a height classes. You know, boxing, we have weight classes, right? So if we have height classes, then small people can be high jump champions. That's fair, no? All right, so that's, I should propose that to an Olympic uh, uh, committee, and then uh, it is likely that athlete who is taller than 6'5", which is uh, Javier Sotomayor, will break uh, Sotomayor's record in the new piece. This is my prediction, right? That's a, so. Okay, now move into relate, relating that into uh, gymnastics. This particular one is called Simone Biles ex executing uh, so-called the uh, Biles move. Uh, we will see some repeat of these things um, in the later slides. So Simone Biles is um, height is 4.8, uh, four, uh, four feet and eight inches, so 1.42 in, in centimeters. Weight is about 100 pounds. She, is, she not only won four gold medals in Rio, but one of the most difficult things to do is that she won three consecutive world all-round championship because you have to spend you know, a long period of time to do these things. So she's considered the best, it's GOAT. She's a GOAT, okay, and uh, in, in gymnastics. So let's see uh, what makes Simone Biles so extraordinarily uh, special. So this is a special footage taken by New York Times. Uh, <clears throat> Simone Biles doing, executing the Biles with a very, very high speed, 200, uh, 120, LPS. Look very quickly when she goes up and somehow she turns around 
And so when she jumps up, she goes backward, but then in the air, she's able to turn around and then she lands forward. Okay? So because I know the frame rate, I can actually calculate hang time, her hang time. It is 111 frames, and then it, it's corresponding to 1.925 seconds. This is really like, you know, Michael Jordan was what? One second, right? And then, of course, uh, it's, this is a, a, there's a cushion in the, in the mat, so she's a little bit aided to that, but it's still extraordinary jumping ability. So I put that here. <laughs> Simon Biles ha has a, a jump, a vertical jump is a 41 uh, uh, inches, and then hang time is 0.925. And then amazing thing is now, you know why I calculate this thing, J factor, is 0.74. She is the highest one. She beats everybody in the NBA, right? This is a critically important to be gold in gymnastics. So let's, let's look at that again. Try to remember that, what I just said. And then now we are looking at a little bit different view. Now look at it. You know, most of you know about angular momentum. Angular momentum is a vector. So not only it has a quantity, but it has a directions, right? So once your angular momentum has a direction without torque, that direction cannot change. She jumped up and then backward, rotating this way, so angular momentum direction is that way. But somehow in the, in the air, she's turning this way, so angular momentum somehow pointing this way, and then she comes back the other way. So she is apparently violating angular momentum. <laughs> is it possible, physicist? I don't think so, right? That's our sacred... Uh, Look. Okay, so let's talk about that, how she does this. Apparent violation of angular momentum, conservation. So we need to dig in a little bit. So first we have to introduce thing called uh, uh, moment of inertia. Now I would like to call it actually, a moment of inertia is, is not quite intuitive uh, uh, words, so I like to use the rotational mass or rotational inertia. So if you have any object rotating about something, every, anytime something rotates, you need to have axis. So you have axis here. And then uh, all the mass is going around, then uh, this rotational mass is mR squared. This is the most important thing. It is proportion to the mass of object, and then distance it's rotating about from that, about that uh, axis, right? So mR squared. Now any other type of shape has just different um, coefficients in front here, factor here, the most important thing is that it all contains mR squared. So the mass is distributed farther away from the axis, you, you have a larger I, okay? That's the only thing you have to remember. So rotational mass is that heavier the mass of obviously, but the, that mass is rotating farther away from the axis that gives you higher rotational mass. And so baseball case is two-fifths of mR squared. Okay, so now let's just accept that angular momentum conserves. So angular momentum conservation is, a, is a, in physics is a sacred law. So then angular momentum is just like linear momentum is m times v. Angular momentum is i, rotational mass times omega, angular velocity. So for same person, if you have, when you're spinning, if you have your arms stretched out, you, part of your mass is away from the rotational axis that makes a rotational mass large. Now, if I put the arm closer, then that, uh, my hands and arm is closer to the rotational axis that makes I, rotational mass, smaller. So now angular momentum conservation is this rotational mass times uh, uh, rotational velocity, angular velocity is the constant. So when this I is large, omega is small, that means spinning slowly. When, when uh, if you make the eye small, then o omega will get larger because of this uh, the angular momentum conservation. So you have this slow spinning uh, speaker skater. By just pulling the arm in, you can spin really fast. Same thing in a diving. When you jump up, your legs or arms are stretched, so your eye is large. Omega is small. But when the, in, the, up, in the air, you can tuck your posi tuck position I is small, that makes omega larger, you spin faster. And then when you go in, you relax, 
and then IV gets large, and then you go to, in with a uh, smaller rotational velocity. So that's how this is used. So this is an actual example of uh, infamous Nancy Kerrigan executing so-called scratch turn. This particular technique is not used anymore by any uh, figure skaters because it considers very easy. But this one really at the, uh, <clears throat> shows how that uh, uh, angular momentum conservation is used in terms of changing I from big to small, making uh, rotation fast. This is another case where jump. You can see every jump is started with the arm stretched out, I is large, and then you are up in the air, she pulls her arms in, and then makes rotation faster, right? Beautiful technique. Okay, so you think that is the uh, best you can do. No, you can do even better. So you, uh, typically, a woman figure skaters uh, can turn three times, triple. But uh, recently, this now quads uh, are uh, routinely being performed and actually successful. So actually, the first successful quad in an event was done by Ando, Japanese uh, uh, figure skater. And then, um, let's see, the, uh, I'm going a little ahead of my, myself, but anyway, so then, then it was executed by a Russian, uh, the uh, figure skaters. So to do these things quad, let me think about, let's think about it. If you want to spin four times, you will need, most important thing is hang time, right? So if you are a, a figure skating coach, when some kid come in and says, I want to do figure skating, the first thing you need, to, you need to do what? Let them jump, vertical jump. If their vertical jump is like 0.5, 5, 50, you know, two feet, forget it. You say, no, go home. So there are certain things you can do. Actually, you can make uh, children's life, you know, safe from misery, right? <laughs> And then you can do some basic tests so that you can indicate, you have those indicators that who can be successful, who are not. So, right? so you need to have a, a long hang time, high vertical jump. And then faster, tighter spin. You need to have faster, to make the faster, tighter spin, I went through already angular momentum conservation, all of these things. When you know, I uh, gets uh, smaller, you can spin faster. Uh, what, what this tells you is that realistically, you have to have thin body, okay? You, have, you need to have thin body so that your hands, arms carries more portion of weight, mass from your body. So when you put, stretch your arm, that creates more eye relatively. And then when you pull in, that, that difference will give you fast, faster. So it's very difficult when you have thick body to, to do a, a quadruple jump. And so you need to have a good hang time and then thin, uh, thin uh, body. So here's a little bit of story, uh, history I already said. Uh, Miki Ando did it in 2002. And then uh, Alexandra Jerusova uh, executed it more recently. One of the most famous one is Camila Valieva, on, only age 15. She uh, executed two successful quad, uh, quad jumps in 2020 to Beijing. Uh, Olympics. So this is the uh, is an image of um, Chirosova doing quad, and so you can see at the point here she's jumping, and that her back is here, and then she jumps one, she rotates once, twice, three, and four. So that's uh, that's what she does. Now let's look at it in in a video. Perfect your technique of putting your arm uh, in the hands over your head. It reduced eye even more than pulling your arm. That's why that they can do these things. So this is a very critical development in, uh, but also it's also, also beautiful you, by, by looks and in, in artistic in terms of, right? So let's talk about a little bit uh, uh, on twisting and diving and gymnastics. This is needed to understand the bios, the bios. So there is a torque twist. Obviously you push your floor and then that generates torque and you can twist. 
The other is a zero torque twist. You can actually, up in the air, with a certain condition, without any torque, but you can actually twist. That's what uh, BIOS does. So there's a constant angular momentum twist, there's zero angular momentum twist. There are two different types. But the one I will talk about is this constant angular momentum twist. So this is not for the physicist, for, for um, <clears throat> any uh, students are here. So the, uh, we have two things, two momentums. One is the linear momentum and the other is angular momentum. Linear momentum, P, is uh, M times a V. So P is M times V, is a vector, so it has a direction. So M, however, M is a scalar number, is just just number. So the P X is a proportion to V X, and then P Y is a proportion to B Y with the same M. So momentum direction is the same as the direction of, of velocity. Okay. However, angular momentum, angular momentum is I times omega, but I in the x component of that going with the x component of angular velocity is not necessarily the same with the y component of i. So direction of angular momentum is not necessarily direction of angular velocity. This is a, even physicists who, you know, who teaches these things but conceptually doesn't quite get this. When, when you see something rotating, the rotational axis we always assume is angular momentum direction, but that's not the case. A lot of times, angular momentum direction is not seen. You will only see the direction of rotational, okay? So, um, now if you look at, if you combine, something is rotating this way, which has a large uh, the, uh, rotational mass. If you turn this way, it's a small rotational mass. You combine them together, it will look like this. So for us, this yellow angular momentum direction, which doesn't change, you don't see, but you, you visually think that it is a red one is the one angular momentum direction. So that looks like a, it's violating angular momentum, but it really isn't, right? So if you make it, I'm not expecting you to understand this, but if you write it, uh, actual, uh, the, the full mathematical form, angular momentum is I matrix of three by three matrix times omega. And so it looks like this. And then in, in, uh, on the other hand, if you write down the linear momentum, it will be the, this matrix is diagonal, okay, because the M is just this number. And so this is the reasons that um, because angular momentum itself is conserved, meaning the direction itself is conserved, right, not only the magnitude, if you change I in the air without any torque, but if you just, you've jumped up, you have certain I, right? But now if I do this, I'm changing I. Then these components are changing. And that will change your omega direction. So that's why when Simone Biles, when she jumped up, she jumped up this way, she was rotating this way, and then she will put her arm, one hand arm just like this, just to, to that's all she does. It changes I and it makes her rotate, okay? Yeah, we'll do that, of course. I know you're gonna ask that question. So this is actually already practice in, in diving. This is one of like fantastic dive by Chinese uh, gold medalist. Oh, thank you. Terrific dive there. See, when she jumped up, right, rotation is horizontal, right? So the, the rotation on the X is horizontal, but up in there, all she does is she put her uh, arm back of the head, the that allows her rotate, twist, and then goes back in. Okay, so it's the same principle. So everything is, you know, if you think about, if you know physics, is it's all connected. So if I give you some random comments, is that um, if Simone were a figure skater, she should be probably able to execute the quadruple jump because she has such a high hang time. And then um, on the contrary to the high jump, which had a taller athlete uh, has, has an advantage. Smaller athletes has an ad inherent advantage in gymnastics, figure skating, half pie, freestyle, skateboarding, and skiing, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so short people, don't be discouraged. You have actual advantage. Okay? I'm not talking too, I'm not too late. <laughs> so, 
The average height of championship female gymnast who has won Olympic individual all-round medals is only five foot, uh, feet one inches. And then uh, according to this, uh, same championship level gymnast, the 78% of women are within three inches above or below five feet. And that average height of US men's national team is 5'7". No, no one above 5'9 is in the team, okay? So now you understand why this, this uh, uh, J factor is important and all of that. And Valieva is 5'3", so she's actually a little taller side. Okay, so let's look at uh, for Yankee is a, uh, again Simone Biles. Okay, New York Times need to have some advertisement that they told me I have to have that in there. I've seen some of like my guy friends try it, but they never land it, so they get really upset. Okay, now watch it again. Uh. Now you can have a much clearer view of what's happening, right? Simone doesn't require a lot of run into her tumbling skills, so she can fit a longer pass. Normally, the separations between first and second place could be three tenths or five tenths, and she goes out and wins by one or two points. That was ugly. I don't care. Bye. I'm smiling. You can stop it now. I would say it's probably no more than three days that it takes her to achieve a new skill. Many athletes, it takes them years. Well, you don't have a hang time. You're not gonna get it, right? <laughs> so. It's also the hardest dismount in the world, and I'm the only one that does it. <laughs> She's bragging a little bit, okay? <laughs> All right. So, why other gymnasts, including top male gymnasts, can execute the vials? Okay, this is like one of my favorite photos with Shakira O'Neill and. Uh, the reason why they can, a uh, male uh, the gymnast can easily uh, duplicate what Bile's doing, is that this J factor, she has extraordinary J factor, which means that because she has a small body, which she has an extraordinary hang time, she can do a lot of things in the air. The male, I mean, the bigger people cannot do that. So that's one of the things. And the second thing is that moment of inertia or rotational mass is unique for everyone. So you, you cannot just simply copy what she does. So you have to figure out, try and error, what works for you, right, and which takes a long time. Okay, so then, uh, I don't know how many of you watched the 2023 NBA Slam Dunk Champion and the championship. This guy, uh, Matt McClung, showed up. It's, it's like sensational, he blew everybody away. 
and uh, he is similar to Simon Viles. He's smallest in, uh, among the NBA players now as a guard, 6.2, and his vertical is 43.5. I cap his J factor is 0.59, close to uh, Jordan is 0.62. So he could do amazing things. Watch it slow motion. What he does when here. I'm not refereeing a basketball. He jump over guy. He actually touched the backboard with the ball and then dunks. Right. If this all happens, what? Basically in one second. This one. He jumps up from uh, behind, uh, backward, and then does 360 and then dunks and then come down with another close to 360. So in terms of uh, the skating world, uh, you will call that as a 720 or 540 or uh, 720. Okay, this is an amazing thing. But remember, <laughs> look these people who really saw many different dunks. So when they you are impressed them, that means you are really really good. So. <laughs> So maybe I should I should be really careful about saying things like that. Apparently, white men can jump, right? All right. Okay. Uh, the six two, but other people are in my Joker, Michael Jordan six six, right? So he's actually small, but he can do things because of the fact. If you, you cannot be too small, because Spud Webb can dunk. But because of uh, basketball, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, rim is too, already high, he cannot do a lot of things because to reach it, right? But I thought right. you argued that if for, for vertical height, it was good to be tall. So for jump, you know? for the jump, yeah. But, but there's two different things. Yeah, the, the, two, two different things. I think you, you may be a little bit confused. In terms of jumping high, just going over things, that's a purely high jump, okay? That taller the better. But doing tricks, doing, tri doing tricks in the air, to spin, to twist, right. you are smaller. If you have the same vertical jump, two people have the same vertical jump, one is a tall person, one is a small. Small, the, the one he particularly does, the one not, Michael Jordan, for example, jumps from the free throw line jumps. That, that is actually a taller per per person has an advantage. Because you have a higher reach, you have to jump over. That does not uh, require a trick. But if you want to spin in the air to dunk, uh -huh. then taller people have disadvantage. OK, so it's a little subtlety. Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Yeah, so there must be some optimal height. Well, depending on what you want to do. It, it depending on what you want to do. Yeah. OK, so let's, let's changing the subject for next about 10 minutes or so. I will tell you something uh, uh, which you will really, really enjoy, change your view of baseball and other sports you are watching. So people think that, you know, like Europeans cannot understand baseball. They said, like, basically players are standing around doing nothing, and once in a while you swing and, then, oh, okay, spit, yes. <laughs> And then, uh, now it's changing, but 20 years or 30 years ago, Americans will say that they don't understand soccer because this bunch of 11 guys wearing shorts and just running around, nothing happens. Nothing happens. And once in a while you score. But I will tell you, there's a lot in common, baseball and soccer, football and volleyball. Okay, so let's quickly go through that. So once uh, at Estonia Group, one of our retired faculty came to me and Changi, is, does curveball really curve? Isn't it just the gravity, you know, make the ball go down? <clears throat> so I said, no, 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 it actually curves. Um, <clears throat> older physicists, I don't know who is the oldest one, I don't wanna, you know, point that out, but some of you probably learned that curveballs curve because of Bernoulli's principle. It is, is wrong, that's, that's not uh, <clears throat> why curveballs curve. So let me explain to you <clears throat> most as simple as possible way. This the, uh, shows the, <clears throat> sorry about my, um, when baseball is moving, that it will face, 
you, you feel the wind coming from towards the baseball, right? It's moving, it's, it's, okay? So when non-spinning, ball is not spinning, then uh, wind velocity in the top and bottom will be the same, so you will feel the same pressure here and the same pressure down there. But now imagine I'm throwing the ball with a spin, so ball is spinning this way. Then, this is like merry-go-round, right? If you are on a merry-go-round and the wind is blowing from this direction, when you go around here, you will feel the much stronger wind in your face. When you're going the other side, when you're going with the wind, you don't feel much of wind, right? So you have much stronger pressure in this side compared to here, correct? So that, the difference in the pressure generates a magnetic force. So it lifts the ball from one direction to the other. All right. So let me look at this side here. So this is the how baseball in a so-called slider. Slider is the one when pitcher throws. This is right handy, righty. Righty is throwing the ball with a making the ball spin most, mostly sideways. Then when ball spins, this right hand side feels more pressure compared to the left side. That magnetic force pushes the ball to this direction. That's why ball goes this way. Okay? And if it has no spin, it will go straight. Now, if you, have, if you are lefty, do the same thing, but now ball is uh, rotating clockwise, magnetic force from left to the right, ball uh, bends to the, to the, the uh, third, third dugout, okay, like this way. So you can do, however, righty can also throw this kind of ball, it's called a screwball, and that's very awkward in terms of arm positions, but there are uh, Valenzuela in 1980s, most of you does not know, but Valenzuela was expert and able to throw uh, with variety, but he was able to throw this way. So he can throw the ball this way and that way at the same time with the same, same arm. So um, you could do the same thing now, rather than from the side, if you look from the side, you can throw the ball with the underspin, then Ball, if you no spin, the gravity will pull the ball down like that. But because under spin makes a magnetic force from bottom to up, and then make the ball drop less. And that's the case of four seam fastball in baseball. When, when you want to throw the ball fast as possible in baseball, you will grab in a four seam, and then uh, that will generate a very strong under spin, and, and that will make the ball actually drop less. And sometimes people say it is actually hopping, rising baseball. It doesn't. The baseball has too, too heavy. Gravity just, uh, you cannot overcome the gravity. However, drop is much less. So, so normally it will go like this, and ball will stay almost, almost flat. So if you are better, you are used to seeing the ball going down. When you see the ball doesn't drop, then it looks like it's rising up. That's why it's called a hopping, a rising baseball. So you usually grab it this way, it's called the four seam because when you grab the baseball like this way, when you rotate uh, once, you will see the seam going across four times. That's why it's called four seam. If you grab along the horseshoe like this, and if you throw it, when you rotate it, you see only two seams cross by. That's called two seam. And so there, I don't have time to de describe all of these things. But now, if you, you can also throw the ball. Uh, you can, sorry, you can throw the ball this way, what we call top spin, right? And then ball will drop more than uh, the, under normal gravity. So then you drop ball like that. In, ba in baseball, it's called curveball. In tennis, it's called uh, forehand top spin. Right? Uh, Rafael Nadal is expert in hitting forehand top spins. So here, actually, I'm giving you some rheumatical numbers so physicists can enjoy. Uh, actually, the record highest measured spinning rate of curveball in MLB is again done by you know my team uh, Mets. And not, an 80 mile per hour of baseball was thrown. A curveball has a 3,408 RPM. RPM is rate revolution per minute. So it, this thing ball turns in one minute 3,500 times. Okay, that's done by Mets pitcher Thas Lugo. MLB average is about 2,500. Uh, 2, in comparison, Rafael Nadal's forehand top spin is about 3,200 on the average. He can hit it uh, sometimes at like 4,000 RPM. Okay, so now let's look at a little bit of numerically. Ball is thrown 80 miles an hour, so it's feeling the wind of 80 miles an hour. 
And then, because the ball is spinning, you know, the top is ro ro going with a 31 miles an hour. If you know the radius and the uh, spin rate, you can calculate this. So I did that for you. And then, but at the bottom, it's going opposite direction. So if you add this together, if you well, on the top, you have 100 miles of wind is at the ball field. At the bottom, you only 50 miles an hour. The, this difference is generating huge amount of magnetic force down, downwards. Okay? That's what makes the curve roll drop. So, this is a very interesting uh, uh, the video I put together for one pitcher throwing four different uh, balls. Top one here is curve ball. He's putting in top spin. This one is uh, four seam fastball he's throwing. You, see, you can see ball is almost staying straight line compared to this curve ball which drops. And here is a slider. He's throwing the ball such that the ball is bending to the left. This one is a changeup. I, I don't have time to explain changeup, but he's throwing changeup such a way that it will bend to the right. So imagine you're a batter, right, facing this guy. It's going to be fastball staying up. It's going to be curveball dropping. It's going to be slider bending to, the, to my uh, right, or it's going to be changeup going to the left. So you have to think about all of that. At the same time, how fast is it going to come? And then which corner it will come? Are you thinking? <laughs> so hitting baseball is like solving 6D dimensional problem in less than 0.5 seconds. So ball comes with the ball is only 60 feet away, and the 100 miles fastball comes in in 0.4 second. If you blink, it's 0.2 second. Human reaction time is typically 0.3 second. So imagine some guy is throwing 100 miles an hour fastball to you. You're trying to hit that thing. You have to calculate all of these things in your head. So this is why many uh, athletes consider hitting a baseball is the most difficult thing to do in sports. So, but baseball, the effect is, is much harder to see, especially if you're sitting in a stadium, you don't see anything, right? Actually, you need to sit in a, uh, at home and TV. You actually you can see more. Uh, but let's see how in which sport we can get more be uh, uh, better effect on these things. Now, so-called form drag drag force is given in this formula. Important thing is that drag is caused by air. So the surface area what you're having is the one causing the drag. So that's this d square here. So Newton's second law, F equals ma, that all of you know. So the acceleration is uh, F divided by m. So if m is smaller for the same size of F, then you will have more acceleration, which meaning deviations. So sports playing the, with the balls that is hollow, which has a larger surface area but mass is lower, you will see more effect of these deviations and, and the curves and stuff. So soccer balls, and then the volleyball, ping pong balls, all of this, all these things have more dramatic effect. Okay? So let's see. Messi, how many of you know Messi? If you don't know, please leave this room. <laughs> Messi is, in, to me, even before he won the World Cup, it's GOAT. That if you really understand what he does with the ball, it's just incredible. There's nobody come close. And look at him the, when he kicks the ball. What is this thing? This is, if you think about it now, if you know baseball, is this curveball or what is it? What, what is it doing, the, the way he kicks? He, slider, thank you. It's a, he's, this is basically slider in baseball, okay? He's doing exactly the same thing. Look how much ball is bending, right? So this one is his wire running. This is his actually favorite position to score. He scored so many goals this way. <laughs> I mean, now if you watch this sport, you will under appreciate what he's doing. He knows exactly, he sees the goal, he bends, puts enough spin so that it goes exactly that way. Right, isn't that amazing? The amazing thing about the Messi is that not only he does these things, he also kicks the ball like knuckleball so he actually, every position, he chooses how to kick. 
Not that many uh, uh, soccer players can do that, but he consciously chooses how to kick. So to, to guide your eye, I put an arrow here. See how much uh, you see the deflection of, of bending of the ball is. It bends almost a meter, right? It's a huge, huge factor. Well, he, he, he looks at it. He look, he, before he kicks it, he looks at it first, and then he kicks the ball, yeah. So this is uh, his uh, you know, World Cup. Finally, he got that what he needed, and then now he's cemented as a goat in, uh, in, in, uh, in soccer, as I should call it, football. Now we can trend, relate that with the volleyball. In the volleyball, there's two different types of serve, okay? You jump, you, you, when you serve it, you put in a top spin by snapping your wrist, and then ball will drop. The advantage of this is that you can hit it as a hard, but because of top spin, ball drops into the court, right? That's why you do this. You put in a strong top spin. Um, that's basically the same as uh, the curve ball. I mean the curve ball in baseball. This one, you see, he put in what? He put it in side spin, right? Side spin, so it's like slider. So. He, this is kind of rare, uh, serving this way, but he see that ball is spin spinning sideways, so deflected to the left, and you know, for re receivers point to the right, so he was not able to adjust to receive that ball. Now, finally, let's talk about knuckleball and then finish the, uh, the uh, uh, lecture. That, this is the very first uh, the slide I show you. Knuckleball is now, you know, what stabilizes any kind of object when you fly is angular momentum, because angular momentum has a vector. Once angular momentum vector is identified, you need a huge torque to change it. So otherwise, the ball will uh, fly in that direction. That's why American football quarterbacks throw football with a what? Spin, you know, with a nice spiral. So, um, you know, if bad, uh, the, um, Quarterbacks will throw the ball with a bad wobbly, you know, because you don't, they don't put in tight uh, spiral, right? So the knuckleball is opposite. You want to throw the ball without angular momentum. So then, then because it doesn't have any uh, direction, and when it goes, any air turbulence will make the ball move. So this is why when knuckleballers, when they throw a ball, they don't actually know how balls are gonna go. Okay, they just basically throw the ball and then see what happens, okay? And so, another thing about baseball is that, of course, baseball, when it first was made, they made it with the seams because that's, it's a necessity, right? You can't really make the leather without having any seams. You have to sew to, together. But it turns out, having these seams are like it's genius because city just has different resistance compared to smooth area, right? Now, most of people think the smooth area will have less resistance and the stitches has more, but actually, I don't have time to discuss all these things. Because of fluid uh, flow, turbulence flow actually has less resistance than, than the smooth flow. So this, for particular speed, velocity you are throwing, stitches area generates less resistance compared to smooth areas. Now, when you're throwing the knuckleball, as it goes, slightly changing, very slightly changing, then stitch that a smooth area will, position will change, then pressure will be different, then makes the ball move this way and that way, depending on the position of these uh, stitch areas. So, um, as I, uh, let's see, hang on. As I said, the, not only pitchers does not know where the ball is gonna go, the call ball thrown, Catchers does not know where the ball is going either. So typically, typically catchers, what they, they use, actually they are allowed to use, uh, uh, knuckleball catchers are their special, uh, specialty. They use big mid, you know, big gloves, so that they can block the ball, okay? So you basically block the ball and, and pick it up a lot of times. So uh, one of the, oh shoot, one of the, <clears throat> one of the fine technique, if, if you are really, really knuckleball thrower, they will throw ball, ball such a way that from pitcher's mound to the, uh, to the home plate, 
it will rotate about one and a half rotations. So then it, it changes uh, strategic position, right? It will go this way, rotate slightly, that moves ball this way, and then rotates more, and then it goes the other way. So you want to make the ball curve twice. So that's the, what you need to perfect. And then if you do that, nobody's going to hit that ball. That's cool. So here's a one uh, a little bit academic uh, plot here. The bottom x-axis is the velocity in miles per hour. This is 60 miles an hour as 100 miles an hour. Baseball is thrown usually about 70 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour this, uh, this area. So it's very interesting. But not only baseball, uh, but soccer, the strongest kicks made Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, kicks about 80 miles an hour. Fast volleyball serve is about 80 miles an hour. Andy Roddy can serve a tennis ball close to 100 miles an hour. All of the sports balls are interestingly, they are all that area. And then that's the area also in terms of resistance, the most interesting area. Uh, for smooth area, baseball has a coefficient, high resistance co coefficient. Uh, stitched area is lower, okay? And uh, uh, baseball is somewhere in between like that, over, uh, on the average. The gravity gives it this one. And then if you go really high speed, it changes, okay? Because of turbulence flow. So now, we, we, all of these things, now you understand what you are watching, okay? RDK throws, because the stitch position changing a little bit, it goes to the right, and it goes to the left. And then this guy says, what the heck? All right. Now, interesting, un interesting thing is that if you look at catcher, look at his eyes. Catcher's not supposed to close your eye. And then this guy looked at the ball and said, oh my god, OK, so I don't know. So he just puts out mid and just somehow luckily got, into, got in, but you know, he didn't really catch him. All right, so this is like one of all-time favorite uh, soccer football kick. It's a 70, 37 meters out, by, done by a Jorginho, a Brazilian soccer player. Look carefully when there's a slow motion comes at the, uh, the spinning of the ball, okay? Look very carefully. It's beautiful. This thing is a like once in a lifetime kick. He can't believe it, right? This actually scored. He look at, Look at the ball. Can you see that? It's exactly like R.A. Dickey's knuckleball, right? First it goes to the right, and it, look at <clears throat> that one when it goes, do you see the spinning? Look, it goes this way and it goes, <laughs> right? And it's exactly like R.A. Dickey. So I chose this one so that they actually matches. And the, this is really deserves one more view, okay? Look at the, uh, <clears throat> when the ball goes sideways, the spinning of that ball. He was able to kick the ball so hard, but right in the, in the middle of the ball, that basically creates no spin. The ball is moving without any spin. Actually, goal, if you see the goalie was moving to the left and to the right, now you look at Look at, look at the spin. It's spinning at all, right? You can see the squares like, you know, uh, the hexagon. It's, uh, it's amazing. It's, a, it's an amazing kick. You can't really duplicate these things. And this is actually happened in the game, right? It's not something practice kick. And then this is a volleyball. Uh, again, when it's, it's too fast, it's very difficult to see. It's 128 kilometers an hour, so 80 miles an hour. And 80 miles an hour ball is coming, you're playing volleyball. See the ball, how it moves? So this guy, he was going to the right, and then, and then he, he hits his face. So when you are playing, who, I don't know how many of you are playing volleyball. Does anybody play volleyball? I used to play volleyball before pandemic. Uh, when somebody serve you 80 miles an hour knuckle volleyball like that, it's called a floater, what do you do? Hi. <laughs> you duck, okay? That's the only thing you can do. Otherwise, you will be dead. <laughs> All right, so let me finish. Uh, <clears throat> some of, of the materials I got um, inspired by Bob Adair. He was also our fellow particle physicist in Yale. And he wrote a very nice book called The uh, Physics of Baseball. And then one day I <clears throat> visited him when I was uh, uh, um, 
the, uh, the putting together materials for a physical sports course I'm doing. And in Yale, my God, he and I met, uh, we spent a whole day just laughing and talking. It was just wonderful because two sports junkie guys just down. And, and so, so I would like to thank him. And then uh, my daughter uh, has done quite a bit of work on the videos, what I'm showing today, including the cover page. So, and then Stony Brook Alumni Association uh, put me to, put together myself and then Bedel Sajay in New York Times to work together. So, so I finish here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenki, for a wonderful talk and uh, wonderful illustrations. The floor is open for questions, further questions. There are two microphones there, so people who have questions can go to the microphone uh, and uh, ask questions if you have. In the meanwhile, if there are people on Zoom, uh, uh, please raise your hand, and as soon as maybe one or two questions here, we'll switch to Zoom questions. Okay, let's go here. Yeah. How should I think about the way a cat can write itself when it's dropped upside down and starts with no angular momentum? What did you say? Uh, how, sorry. How should, how should I think about how a cat can write itself when it's dropped upside down? Yes, yes, that is uh, actually, I didn't have the time to talk about it. It's, it's uh, uh, zero angular momentum rotation. So essentially what it is doing is the same thing with i times omega, right? i times omega is the one which makes so when, what the cat does when it falls down, he stretches, it changes his body position, so the center of the eye uh, changes eye, that allows rotate. That's how, that's how it does. It, yeah, that's the one in my slide, the fourth one, which I, I didn't highlight. So it is zero angular momentum uh, twist. Thank you for that, it was awesome. Um, two questions, one, uh, what are your sports and do you apply your physics knowledge to them? And two, when are you gonna incorporate swim strokes into your presentation? Swim strokes, okay, yeah. well, uh, I also had uh, some swim slides, but because of time, you know, I have to cut out all these precious <laughs> slides. Uh, I do have that, uh, some. And um, uh, in terms of sports, uh, do I, I play all sports, but I kind of mediocre, okay? <laughs> I, I was never a super athlete. However, I did better than I think uh, in most sports because I think about it and apply in, you know, uh, physical things. So one thing I really want to talk about it, I just didn't think I had time. Super Bowl, you all watch Super Bowl, right? Uh, no? Come on, Yankee. <laughs> all right, in a Super Bowl, when Kansas City won, there was one critical play in the fourth quarter. There was a punt came. And if you are a football coach and then the punters, they have tendency thinking, I want to kick long, okay? So if you kick long, you want to take a long time for them to return, that makes sense, no? But that's not what you're supposed to do. Actually, they made a critical mistake, the opposing team, because they kicked the ball too long if you kick the ball too long, what happens is that hang time is, too, I mean, not hang time, the distance wise. So distance, kicking long distance is a 45 degree or so approximately like 30, 40 to 45 degree, you kick it, and the ball goes the longest. But to have a maximum hang time, you have to kick it high, higher angle. So these are not compatible. But if you kick too long with a, with a smaller hang time, what happens is the other team will get the ball, receiver, but your teammates are not there yet. Uh, Player, the NFL player runs about one second in one 10 yards, okay? So if you kick like 40 yards or 50 yards, 60 yards, your teammate has only ran about 40 yards. The guy who is excellent athlete, athlete runner gets the ball, you have 10, 20 yards room to maneuver, get the speed, accelerate, then you cannot catch. And that's what was a Super Bowl like winning thing. So what you wanna do, if I were coach, I would have to kick high, get 30 yard, that's all we need, but make sure if it's a 30 yard, you have five, five second hang time, your play will be basically there when you, the other team catch the ball. You ensure that ball is dead at that point. You do not allow, you do not make them to ch take chance. This is a very simple things, 
see, as a, as, a, as a physicist, I can think about, but most of college football coaches does not know these things. They just do things by, you know, some experience and whatever. Okay. Okay. Uh, actually, my question is nothing to do with the sports. First of all, my apologies for that one. Okay. So what I have noticed is that there are some animals in the wild, some cats, they can, their height is of the order of something like two feet or so, but they can vertically jump 15, 16 feet in order to catch their prey. How does that really work? That's one thing. And another thing is that, say for example, mongoose. Whenever there is a fighting between the mongoose and a, a cobra, mongoose twists in the air in order to get away from the, uh, uh, what's called, the bite from, uh, from the cobras. There also there is a lot of, lot of things, very interesting stick that I think there is a lot of physics really goes in that one. So do you have any comments about the vertical jump by a small animal by about 15, 16 feet? Well, I mean, you, you know, one of the uh, biggest thing is a flea, right? Fleas can, can jump like, you know, huge amount. So I'm not, I'm not expert in physiology. It has to do with the physiology of the mechanism of the, what we call uh, fast muscles are the one usually responsible for high jumps, right? So the, how the fast muscles are constructed for that particular animal, and, and then that allows them, and so the, I'm not going to answer that in the physiology point of view. It's not, not really physics. And then in terms of twisting, it's the same thing. You could do the twisting as, as a zero gravity twisting, torque twisting. You can do that by using the same principles why I talked about in uh, Simon Biles. Okay. Thank you. Jenki, let's take a couple of questions on the... Internet. Yes, we have a question from our virtual audience. Can you speak on the relationship between climate change and warming air and the frequency of home runs? Okay, sure, absolutely. I, I will say uh, that particular one, I, this recently there were some articles about it. It's because of we have so much attention to climate change uh, that got, I will say, a little bit too much attention. Um, you don't have to have climate change in a difference in the home run. If you go to Denver, Denver has a much thinner air because of high altitude, a mile high, high altitude, thinner air, thinner, uh, less pressure, and you will hit a lot more home run. That is far more than climate change contribution of anything. If you want to do even better than uh, Denver, where do you want to go? 1968, there was uh, Olympics in Mexico City. If you play all NBA games, MLB games in Mexico City, you will have far more home runs. So if you are, if you are a baseball player, if you are a hitter, where do you want to go? You want to go to Denver. Now, most of people think that hitting, uh, the home run is only about the thin air when you hit the ball, how the ball trajectory feels less uh, air pressure, uh, air resistance. But it's actually more than that. For all the things what I show you, the sliders, curve rolls, force in festival, all these things, all of these uh, variations, you can, uh, tricks, you can put it in because of air. So what happens when air becomes thinner? Less. So your curveball is not going to drop much. Your slides are not going to bend much. Your force infestor is not going to stay up as much. That means hitters are going to have a much easier time to hit. So if you are a pitcher, don't ever go to Denver. <laughs> right? And so this, again, it's kind of knowledge. If you're a physicist, you know, obvious. But most of the agent guys, they don't know. So they say, well, then Denver seems like a nice place to go play, you know, to the pitcher to go there. And then they're like, you know, uh, stat goes, just goes, goes down, you know, because you cannot, you cannot do any of those things. Denver, you will go play uh, there if your pitcher just fire thrower. If you are, fastball is the only thing you, in, in your arsenal that you can throw fastball after fastball, then, then that's, that's where place to go. Otherwise, if you are finesse, uh, Pitcher, don't go there, right? So uh, climate change, the uh, warming, it's not just climate change, it's climate warming. Temperature warming will make it uh, air a little bit less denser. Because then the warm air is less dense. So that's, that gives you a little bit of less drag, and then it contributes, it's the 
contribution is a very small fraction compared to uh, all differences in, in, uh, in terms of stitch height, okay, and other, how you manufacture balls, all that kind of things. And also psychology. When everybody, all the batters are trying to hit base home run rather than you know, one, two base runs, then you will create more home runs. So the, the player's attitude also contributes a lot more than, than climate change. Right, let's get one more question. Is oh, I have yeah. one here. Oh, sure. It was absolutely fantastic, Chunky. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask from the standpoint of teaching physics to non-majors, it's clearly it would be absolutely captivating. And I'm wondering in your experience, how much physics do you feel like, how to say it, if supposing when we're deciding at another university, should we institute a course like this for non-majors? Absolutely. Tell, tell us a little bit about your experience. I can sort of imagine an argument that, well, there, it's so much more captivating that they somehow internalize it and they learn more. On the other hand, one could worry that they, they come away with sort of stories or something. Just please expound on that general question, thanks. Yeah, well, thank you for asking that question. In fact, that's very important. That's why I actually started this course. If you travel around, almost a lot of you have probably done that. Anywhere in the world, if you ask young people, what is the most difficult subject? It is physics. And that is not just they're saying. There's a reason why they're saying that. It's a physics who uses mathematics as a language. So you have to be good at mathematics first. And then you translate the, uh, natural observations, phenomenon, with the mathematics you have to describe. So physics is difficult. We have to, as a physicist, if we want to be a good, effective teacher, you have to first accept that. You can't just say, just because you are good at physics, I say, oh, physics is easy. And that already starts with the wrong way with the students. Yeah. So we accept the fact that physics is difficult. Then you have to figure out how we can have the things a little bit easier, have them to be more, feel comfortable. Is that if you use topics like sports, not everybody is you know, watching sports, young kid doesn't, okay? But there's a large fraction of uh, American population watches sports students are interested in. Those students, when they hear Tom Brady, you know, Joe Montana, or, or Derek Jeter, Michael Jordan, they feel already comfortable. They, are, they come to my class just see me chatting about these things, right? So they're already coming in with a, <laughs> their attention is fully on me. Then I sneak in some physics in there. <laughs> And, and then they actually you know, learn things, and then uh, I, all my homework problems is particularly designed, I always look at current event, what, what Mets did yesterday, what uh, Giants did yesterday, what was the score, what was the things. And then if I have a hang time problem, I will say, oh, Giants yesterday punter punted in the third quarter, right, and then he punted a certain amount, and then that was terrible because they returned and scored touchdown. And then I write the homework problems, that. Then they, wa they watch the game, they say, wow, this is interesting. They want to figure out, they want to know the answer. So all of everything, not only the, the lecture, but homework itself is structured. And then I developed the lab, lab courses, also uh, completely new. I use the three-point shots, uh, for they will go outside to three-point shots to measure projectile motion. And then they also measure their own hang time and then uh, vertical jump. And so all of these things. So you have to put in an effort to do something very unique to capture, essentially the idea is to capture their attention and then instill their uh, desire to learn, right? So I cannot say, you know, I didn't do assessment uh, tests and things like that, I don't know. But I do uh, meet in a Stony Brook area when I go having dinner Oftentimes, I meet students come and say, oh, Professor Zhang, that course I took with you, physical sports, that like, changed my life in terms of see, looking at uh, sports. So that's all I can say. Is that right. Good? On that high note, let's thank Chen Qi one more time. And thank you for coming. Thank you for people on the, on, on the Zoom. And we'll meet you tomorrow morning.